All right, thank you. Welcome, everybody. And thank you for spending some time with us to, today. This should only be about a half hour. So uh, thank you for taking time out of your, your busy schedule. And, uh, and, well, hopefully you get to learn something a little bit new today. And today's topic is going to be osteoporosis. Um, my name is Dr. Brett Klusko. I'm a chiropractor in Edmonton. And osteoporosis is something very big in my world because uh, uh, for those of you that know what we do as chiropractors, a lot of it is with the, the skeletal system, is with the bone. And osteoporosis is simply just um, poor bone quality. And so as a chiropractor, we attack the body by looking at the nervous system and eliminating interference and let the body do what it's supposed to do. But we do that by moving the bone and, and, and adjusting joints and going through that. So if the bone isn't good, we, we really are limited in what we can do with the body. So bone health for us is, is a, a, a must, is an absolute must. So I'm going to go right into the presentation here. Now, um, osteoporosis is nicknamed the silent thief. And, and what that basically means is that it's, it's kind of hidden in the background. I'm going to expand on that a little bit further as we get going here. Um, So what is osteoporosis? Now, osteoporosis is uh, basically, uh, there's two ways of looking at bone and looking at disease. And uh, bone can e either be kind of qualified as quantity or quality. And we're going to talk a little bit about quality. And quality is osteomalacia. And that means that basically your bone is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's not aligning properly. It becomes brittle. But that's not what osteoporosis is. Pro osteoporosis is when bone quantity diminishes. And what that means in this picture here, as you can see, is that on the left is healthy bone. You can see how dense it is and how uniform it is. And although there's these little pockets everywhere, they're nice and small and dense. And if you look on the right, osteoporosis is that that bone is gone. That mineral, mineralization has, has disappeared. And that is a very big problem because as that, that, that the bone becomes more brittle and leads to fracture. So Osteoporosis is the most common metabolic disorder worldwide, which means that pretty much everybody at one point is going to deal with it. And that's a, that's a very kind of sobering fact, but very true. Uh, the older we get, it is going to be something that affects us. Now, it may not affect us, affect us all directly, but we may know somebody with it. And why it's called the silent thief is because it is clinically silent, meaning that you don't feel it. People don't come in saying, ow, my osteoporosis hurts, or yeah, the osteoporosis is really acting up kind of thing. We don't see it usually until something happens, and that something is fractured. People will fall and break something, or so some people even sneeze or cough, so we have to be proactive with our care. And it's also one of those, the most significant disabilities that someone can endure, and what we mean by this is that fracture, osteoporotic fracture can be life-threatening and can change how somebody's quality of life is, and it can make it a lot worse very quickly. We're going to go through that in a little bit. It is also the leading cause of morbidity and mortality of the elderly, as in this is the leading problem to death in the, uh, the aging population. So worldwide statistics here, in America alone, it costs 12 to $18 billion a year just in hospitalization costs. That is a staggering, staggering number. That is absolutely debilitating, and that's just in America. In 2025, it's expected for that cost to double and triple by the year 2040. So that is a significant amount of money just in osteoporosis in America. If we look around the world, there are 75 million people in US, Europe, and Japan that are reported to be osteoporotic right now. Approximately 7 million osteophytic fractures happen per year in the world. North America is the fourth most common place for osteophytic fractures to occur. There are places that are more common. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So out of all the fractures that happen with osteoporosis, hip and spine are the two most common, with hip being the absolute leader. So let's talk about the hip a little bit. It definitely happens more in women than men. Uh, women are, have a higher predisposition to osteoporosis and therefore have more osteoporotic fractures. When you break a hip and have osteoporosis, less than 50% return to full function. 25% increased risk of death during the first year. That means you have a 25% high, a higher chance of dying the first year for any reason. And then within two years, and this is a very sobering statistic, I had to read this two or three times, approximately 50% of people that have a fracture of the hip due to osteoporosis die within two years. So that means you fall and you break your hip and you have osteoporosis. There is a 50-50 chance you may not make it for two years. 
Now, even though osteoporosis occurs more in men or more in women than men, it is actually way more deadly for men. It's two times more likelihood that you will die from a hip fracture being a male than a female. So even though guys may sit there and be like, oh, this is what girls have to worry about and everything like that, that's, that, that, that's not overly true. You have half a chance of getting it, but double the chance of dying from it. So 4% of women die from a hip osteoporotic hip fracture versus 10% of men. So we move to the spine. The spine is the second most common cause and usually happens what's called the thoracolumbar junction, which in this picture on the right here is about a third of the way up. Now, if you have a spinal fracture due to osteoporosis, you have a five-fold risk increase for having another osteophytic fracture. So we just discussed how significant these fractures can be. If you have a spine fracture, which some of them don't even have um, pain that goes with this. A lot of people don't even know they did have it, but it gives you a five-fold increase of chance for another fracture, which is very significant. So let's, let's go through some risk factors here. Now, uh, we've already kind of talked about it really quickly, is that women have a two-fold chance over men of having that. Now, we, we're going to discuss this a little bit further, why that is, uh, but some of the, the factors are preventable and some of them aren't. As you can see, hysterectomy is a big one and postmenopausal is another really big one. Now, both of these things have a lot in common is that there's a massive decrease in estrogen at these times and estrogen is vital, vital for men and women for bone health. Ethnicity is another big risk factor. Like I said, these are all non-preventable. Non so these things you, you can't change. So ethnicity, we find that fair-skinned people or fair-skinned descent, usually Northern European, have a higher likelihood of osteoporosis. Family history is also something. So if, you're, if your parents had it, or a mom, or a grandma, or a granddad, or anything like that, you automatically have a higher possibility of having osteoporosis. Age is another one that goes with it as you get older having osteoporosis. So let's look at the, some preventable risk factors. Sedentary lifestyle is a massive, massive one. I'm gonna really red flag that one. I really put a star next to that one because that is huge. People that live a life of not moving, whether you sit around, you're not very active as it is, or you have a job that makes you sit for long periods of time, whether that be in a vehicle or a desk, or you travel lots for work and you're constantly sitting and not moving, that this can be a big problem. Minimal sun exposure, this can be another big one because in Canada, as you see right now, I'm looking out the window and a month ago, that was the whiteout. So having sun directly onto our skin is very important. Urban and rural residents, another really big one, and this is just goes to straight common sense. People that live usually out in, the, in a farm are gonna be more active. They're gonna be doing more manual type of labor than someone that lives within the city. Lifestyle, very big one. Smoking, alcohol consumption, caffeine are all massive contributors to demineralization of our bones. Nutrition is going to be another one that I'm going to attack pretty heavily and that one kind of goes a little deep so I'm not going to hit it onto it right now but I will talk about it quite a very unique with this. It's something that we always look at osteoporosis being old person disease. In fact, it is not. It is something that is the critical periods at a young age and we're going to talk about that more once again. Medification, uh, medications, especially steroids, are massive bone leachers. You always see those commercials, especially in the States where it's Here's what blah, blah, blah can do for you, but here are the 100 side effects. And a lot of them can be fractures or, or weak bones. And it, it's simply just a side effect of the medication is that it, it lowers your bone stability. And then we move to chronic disease. Chronic disease can be things that are preventable due to lifestyle, things like liver disease. Now, sickle cell doesn't fall into that, but it's still a very big factor. So moving forward on some, some facts of osteoporosis. Bone is dynamic, as much as it seems like this big, solid thing. It is very dynamic, it's constantly changing over it, but it does it very slowly, where our skin cells can change over in a few days, 10 years. And now, when we're, when we're young, we have, de we have two things that happen with bone. We have deposition and re uh, resorption. And now, uh, one builds bone, one eats or takes away bone and gets rid of it. Now, when we're younger, we obviously, bone deposition is going to be much greater than resorption. But as we age, that slows and ultimately reverses. So as, as, as being preventative, we need to work on things that keep that balance as equal as possible, favoring growth as much as we can. But there are many substances to our body. A lot of us think bones, we think calcium. But there's much more than just calcium for bone maintenance. There's magnesium, phosphorus, boron, silicon, vanadium, vitamins B, D, and K, protein, estrogen, the list goes on and on. And the more we're starting to discover all these different elements of our food, the more we realize that you know, there's a lot more to the picture than just, say, calcium and magnesium. So maximum peak bone mass occurs at 25 to 30 years old, which means that usually for us, for in our bones, we have a maximum built as we reach our 30s, which means we usually don't get more. There are circumstances, but we, we never really reach more than that past that. So it's very important at that younger age, what I mentioned before, to stay on top of this. Another very interesting thing is that 80% of women's bone mass is acquired before the age of 12. 
And this is something that really stood out to me when I was, I was reading this research and reading these, these studies is that uh, we always think that osteoporosis is an old person disease, and this is the perfect example age that does so much for us at an older age. So 80% of women's bone, ha bone mass is acquired before the age of 12. This has led a lot of researchers to come to the conclusion that osteoporosis is not an aging disorder, but in fact is a pediatric disorder. And that is a very sobering thing, is that uh, how important it is for, for pe uh, people, uh, male and female, but especially women suffer from eating disorders. And as much as there are males in there, it heavily favors the female side. And juvenile anorexia is a very big one. The, the girls that aren't eating due to the image or whatever it may be are drastically changing their body for the worse into their later years in life and can really significantly lower not only their lifespan, but their quality of life. So something very important to keep on makes you really emphasize how important children are at, at getting good nutrition and taking care of their bodies. So estrogen is extremely important. As estrogen decreases in the body, osteoporosis increases. So with menopause, 11% decrease in bone density five years after menopause. So that is, a, that is one tenth of your bone mass gone within five years. Every year after that five years, for a decade, an additional, doing the math on that, that can be an extra, your, one third of your bone mass can be gone within 15 years after, after menopause, which is mass very significant. So let's talk about the elderly a little bit. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of want to be one of, one of these. So I want to be out there having fun and moving around and doing things and, and getting going, but that's not always... The, uh, that's not always reality, right? And I, I probably have a lot of us have a grandparents or parents that are getting into that age where they're, they're needing assistance and they're, they're becoming more brutal and osteoporosis is a real thing that they don't already have it, they're coming to be dealing with it. Now the silver tsunami, I don't know if anybody's heard that terminology, but the silver tsunami is the baby boomers. They are coming into the age where they're going to be demanding or needing more attention to health uh, in healthcare. And this is the first time ever in human history where the age of the baby boomers is the fastest growing subset of the population. That has never, ever happened before. This is going to code our system, but all the supporting secondary or tertiary healthcare systems. And osteoporosis can be one of the biggest ones. But the ability to maintain independence is the most important concern for the elderly. When they lose that, it creates a downward spiral emotionally and physically that ultimately can lead very quickly to, to their death or to being bedridden and in a home where they need assistance all the time. And also on top of that, prescriptions for osteoporosis are ridiculously expensive. In fact, there's one I'm not going to name, but four pills in the States cost about $125. That's one month. Four pills. So if you drop one of those pills in the toilet, you might be diving after. You might be going after pretty good. So that is care here. So what can we do to, to make ourselves better? Um, biggest one that we're going to be looking at is the non-preventative argument versus the preventative argument. Genetics versus environment. What is more important? Is it the fact that my parents have it, that I'm going to get it, or is it the fact that I can live a healthy lifestyle and that's going to change it for me? We already saw all the risk factors, and the one that stands out more than anything else for determining whether or not you're going to have it is lifestyle. What you do every day that will prevent you from having brittle bones or osteoporosis. So let's go through some of these. Exercise is really important. The best exercise on the planet is the one you do. But when it comes down to osteoporosis, there are certain exercises that are better. Axial weighting is any exercises that use your body weight with gravity and puts pressure through your weight-bearing bones, like your ankles, your your lower legs, your hips, through your spine. Those are really important. That's your axial skeleton. So these exercises include simple things like walking, running, Zumba exercises, step classes, studio classes, yoga is a good one, anything like that that does that. Another really good one for my favorite is I think everybody should be at least doing some sort of weightlifting, at least once or twice squat with 135 pounds on your shoulders. But it could be even something as 25 pounds each hand or 10 pounds each hand. A little bit extra weight is going to really force your body to deposit strength where it's needed. These exercises also should be done at least three times a week for at least 30 minutes at a time. The, the ultimate is going five to six days a week and always giving yourself one day for rest so you're not overworking your body. Exercises to avoid. Now, these aren't exercises that are bad. These are just exercises that are not going to be putting weight in the areas that we need such as swimming. Swimming is a fantastic aerobic exercise, but it will not build strength in your bones. Biking is another good one. These are low impact exercises that are very good for your cardiovascular health, but if you're suffering from osteoporosis or a risk for it, then these are two exercises you may want to lower and increase other different types. Another big one too that's not going to help you, the shake weight. Probably not going to help your bone strength. So nutrition is going to be probably one of my biggest my biggest attacks for this. Now, nutrition is something that 
it's simple in concept, but we hear a lot, we see a lot, and we're always told what we should be doing, and here's the next best thing, here's a diet for this, and a diet for that. And it really becomes confusing ultimately when we look at it. So when it comes to nutrition, like I said, there are multiple substances and a lot of pathways to get our bones healthy, to deposit the calcium where we need it, to hold out where we don't need it, to align it properly. And like I said before, some of these are calcium, magnesium, uh, vanadium, phosphorus, silicone, boron, vitamin B, D, and K, protein, and estrogen. But they need to be in balance. And where we get these is from our food, from a balanced diet. These are not going to be made in a the lab. These are not going to be put into a powder where you can basically eat that and you're good to go kind of thing. And you get your vitamin B from a complex. It doesn't work that way. These are things that you need to get in balance. For example, phosphorus is needed, but in excess, leaches calcium out of your body. So let's look at the healthy eating plate. Now, I don't go by the Canada standard ones. I think it's a little bit, it's, it, it's not right. I go by the Harvard one. The Harvard one is the best one I see. Now, you can see immediately right out of the gate that half your plate is fruits and vegetables. You should be really eating about 7 to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Now, 13 if you're on the kind of high-performing athlete side, and 7 if you're a little bit more sedentary, but ultimately, you should be aiming for 13 and a bare minimum of 7. You read through a few of these at healthy oils, and you have whole grains, so whole food, healthy protein. Choose fish, poultry, beans, nuts, things like that. You want to limit your... Your red meat, especially, you know, the steaks from Costco look really nice, but there's no way a regular animal makes that big of steaks. So really limit what you're getting. And you can always splurge. Don't worry. I'm, I'm not perfect. I will eat that stuff once in a while, but limit it. And one thing standing out here, I don't know if anybody noticed, but this dairy is, is gone from this picture. And they have a little thing in here that basically states that you limit your milk and dairy to one or two, per, one or two servings per day. And that's basically going to be like half a glass of milk. That's it. That's all they say. And the reason behind this is that our dairy products, number one, are not made for human consumption. They're made for a baby animal of wherever you get it from, whether it be goat or cow. But also on top of that, it creates a lot of inflammation within our bodies. There are a lot of inflammatory responses. Inflammation is ultimately the core to a lot of our diseases. So let's talk about calcium a little bit. Calcium intake is vital and is one of the first things you hear about your bones are weak, take some calcium. But like I just said, dairy products should be limited. So where else can you get this calcium? I'm going to talk about that soon. On top of that, one of my favorite examples to use about calcium and how it's improperly kind of promoted in the, in the world of things like uh, uh, how to get into your body via supplementation. And my favorite is Tom's. And when I was living in the States, they had these commercials where they're promoting calcium at Tom's. They're saying, oh, there's so many milligrams of calcium in every Tom tablet. So not only are you curing your heartburn, but you're getting a whole bunch of calcium. Well, Tums decreases the acidity of your stomach, but you need an acidic environment within your stomach to properly absorb calcium. So out of all that calcium they had in Tums, you're actually only absorbing about 4% of what they said you because they were creating a, uh, a uh, alkaline environment in your stomach. Now, now, a little disclaimer on that. A lot of people hear alkalinity is really important for the body, and that's very true. You need to be making your body more alkaline, but your body, your stomach, needs an acidic environment to start the absorption process. So recent research into calcium supplementation shows that uh, it, calcium is not being absorbed the way we thought it was. Like I said, one of the first things I do is throw calcium supplements here, here, get these in. And the studies have shown that, yeah, there is more calcium getting to the bones, but a lot of this calcium is entering the blood and not leaving the blood. Like I previously stated, you need a lot of other compounds that not only get your calcium into the blood, but pull it out of the blood, through the capillary beds, and into the tissues where it's needed. Calcium by itself cannot do that. So what they're finding is this calcium itself from the walls of these arteries, and it's creating calcification. And that calcification, the hardening, is referred to as arteriosclerosis. And that is one of the first, first signs of heart disease. So people that have long-term supplementation of calcium are finding that have early onset heart disease due to arteriosclerosis. So there's a lot of research coming up that maybe those calcium tablets, those calcium using complexes, aren't the best solution to getting more calcium into your bones. So what are the best sources of calcium? This is one of my favorite pictures. I always give this to my patients who ask that question. You can see here, this is a, a lot of plants. And you see that, well, if you just kind of look at all the colors, you notice most of them are dark green leafy vegetables. Broccoli, bok choy, okra, artichokes, turnips, celery, dandelion, fennel, spinach, kale, asparagus. All these things have one thing in common is they're the dark green leafy vegetables, but they have the vitamin K and they have high amounts of absorbable, bioavailable calcium. But we have other things too. You have onions, you have cocoa meat, gooseberries, butternut squash. All of these have very good, very bioavailable sources. And what I mean by that is it doesn't only get into the body and into the blood, but it's utilized where the body needs it. And it comes in a balance where the body doesn't just excrete it right out of the kidneys as soon as it gets it. So it carries all these things, all these different compounds, all of it together in this beautiful synergistic effect that your body knows what to do with it. On top of that, 
It has tens of thousands of phytonutrients working this energy. All these things we know nature works to do. We are designed to eat what nature supplies, not isolated fragments. Our body does not know what to do with that. So something I have in my practice that I utilize quite a bit is it's, it's very difficult for a lot of these people or a lot of average people to get 7 to 13 servings of, of these fruits and vegetables they need. As you can see, it's, it's not only just important for pretty much every organ of the body, but it's especially important for your bones is a, high, a diet high in fruits and vegetables. But if you were to tell somebody, listen, I want you to go home, eat 7 to 13 servings and different stuff, try to eat a rainbow. It becomes hard. It becomes complex. And with complexity, people kind of fall off of being able to do it. It creates non-compliance. And I find that with my patients, the minutes, minute it becomes complex, people turn off, they don't want to do it. So what I have in my practice is something called Juice Plus. And it's literally the, be the next best thing to fruits and vegetables. Uh, through my, my schooling, you basically got everything going. You. This is going to be the next best thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the only thing that actually made sense to me. And here's why. It has 30 different fruits and vegetables in it. They are not modified. They are just ground up and have water pulled out of it. So they are literally the next best thing, fruits and vegetables. They have the whole rainbow. Look at all the green that's in it. They're going to be giving you all the calcium, magnesium, boron, silicon, vanadium, everything you need that we have discussed previously in the correct, in the correct ratios to get into your system and be utilized properly. As a practitioner, research is something very, very important. I need to have research behind it because I need to be able to lean on it if somebody has a question saying, prove it. I need to be able to fall back on that. It is non-GMO. It is NF certified, which means it is third-party third tested to make sure that what they say is in it is actually in it and there's not contaminants. I refer to NSF certification as better than organic certification because it simply is. So the three reasons why I use it in my, my practice is it's simple. People can do it. People can grasp that. I go, yeah, I can, I can do that. It'll help bridge that gap. It has research. And the last one is that it's affordable. It costs about the same amount as a single cup of coffee every day. So if you know that person that drinks five or six cups of coffee a day, you sacrifice one, you can get this into your system every single day. So to further nutrition a little bit, what's just important that you should be putting in, there's also a lot of things that you shouldn't be putting into yourself or your bone health. Carbonated beverages is one of the first ones you hear. And what we talked about before is has excessive amounts of phosphorus in it. Phosphorus and calcium work in an inverse relationship. The higher amounts of calcium you have, your body pushes up phosphorus. The higher amounts of phosphorus you have, your body pushes up the calcium. You need to have a balance. So if you're taking in a ton of pop, and that can even be one to two pops a day, can create this excess buildup of phosphorus. Caffeine is another big one. It leaches calcium right out of your body. You pee it right out. So if you know a person that drinks more than one cup a day, it's, it's going to be affecting the bone health. Alcohol, more than one serving a day, leaches your calcium out of your system. Stimulants affect how the calcium and magnesium and all the other things you need to get into your bones is distributed. So stimulants like uh, Red Bulls and other different types of caffeine stuff like taurine are going to be affecting it. Processed sugar is a very inflammatory product or food, and it's going to affect those, those processes. Artificial sweeteners, trans and hydrogenated fats, basically they just stop the body from being able to do, their, do a lot of their things to be. Vitamin D, as previously discussed, is very important in Canada as we lack a lot of sun during, well, depending on where you are, sometimes six months out of the year. And right, right now, we, we probably, it's going to be dark when I wake up, but it's going to be dark when I come home from work. And vitamin D is essential, and you get it from the sun. You need 20 to 30 minutes of unobstructed sunlight every single day. And a nice little fact for you, the most, or the lowest amount of vitamin D in people's body in North America is actually in Florida. And the reason being is that people just throw sunscreen on like crazy and always walk outside with full-length clothes on. Now, you need that sunlight every day. If you don't get it, the supplementation is extremely important for us in Canada. There is a, a disorder called seasonal affective disorder, or SAD, and it literally changes people during the winter months into a depressive state, and it's directly related to vitamin D consumption. So if you're not getting enough, you know you're not getting enough, as in most of us, and it may be important to supplement with vitamin D. Early detection is something else that we, we can treat ourselves with. As previously stated, it is the silent thief. We don't feel it coming until it's too late. So people that have multiple risk factors should consider screening in order to stay on top of their bone health. So how do you do that? Is there a scan that you can do? And absolutely there is. Dual energy x-ray absorptiometry with big words. Um, a DEXA scan is the gold standard for assessing bone density. It is taken either on the ankle or of the spine and will tell you specifically with incredible detail what your bone density is like. So if you do have three or four different risk factors and you know you're at risk, and you've been told you're at risk, and you just 
you know that this is going to be something you have to deal with. And getting a DEXA scan every two to three years is very important. On top of that, it's very important to get this DEXA scan at the same lab and the same body part each time as there are discrepancies between machines and the accuracy of them can vary. And it's very important to have it as accurate as possible for future scans to be comparable. Um, something that as chiropractors we see is the x-ray and the first thing we look at is, okay, is bone density adequate? But x-ray is not good enough, you're not sensitive enough to act on already being diagnosed, you refer for a DEXA scan. So know that X, even though you had an x-ray and they said everything's fine, it may not be good enough, okay? So now I fall into chiropractic, which is my bread and butter. Chiropractic is something I, I know is extremely important, as I talked about bone health, is the utmost importance to us. The premise, basically, what we talked about is the chiropractors, we try to remove interference, but we do that through adjusting through the skeletal system. But really importantly, for being proactive with osteoporosis via chiropractic, is that chiropractic allows you to feel better. It allows you to move better. And one of the biggest things we talked about was exercise being vital. Exercise is probably, second to nutrition, is one of the most important things you could possibly do. But how are you going to do it if you're not feeling good? Let's say your back is hurting. You're not going to have that want to go and go for a long walk or hop on a hop on a treadmill in the gym or go lift some weights. So as chiropractors, we really try to get people just feeling better, moving better. And when they feel better, move better, they're going to keep doing things that are going to allow them to keep feeling better and moving better for longer periods of time. The biggest key in all of this is prevention, stopping it before it starts. As we talked about, this is starting to be seen as a pediatric disorder. The earlier we start, the better it can be. I always like to go by the saying, it's a lot easier to keep children healthy than it is to treat sick adults. And it is very, very true. So in conclusion, as we age, we all have to deal with osteoporosis at one point in our lives. We need to be able to recognize preventable and non-preventable risk factors in our lives and take charge. The ultimate cure for osteoporosis is stopping it before it starts with healthy lifestyle. So your health is in your hands. All it needs and all I recommend is one simple change every month. It doesn't have to be just stop, restart, and do everything in one little thing. If that's getting outside for an extra little walk, if that's eating two or three more servings of fruits and vegetables a day, if that's incorporating juice plus into your life to bridge that gap between what you are supposed to be taking and what you actually are eating. It's, it's very important to just start light and try to incorporate things you can do for the long term. Make choices that become healthy habits you can carry through the rest of your life. And always remember, this doesn't come out easy. What you put in is what you get. If you don't put in anything, you won't get anything. But if you really invest some time, you get a lot. Long-term consistency trumps short-term intensity. No true words have ever been spoken. Be consistent rather than going all out for one month and then you're good for 11 months. It doesn't work that way. And another quote that I love to live by is the doctor of the future will give no medicine but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame and diet and the cause and prevention of disease. It's very, that's a, a something I hold very close to my heart and something that I do as a practitioner is I try to live the lifestyle, not just say to do it, as in do I say not what I do kind of thing. I truly try to live all this. I, I, I will not recommend something without having done it first myself. Uh, and I always like to end with that. There are two types of people on the planet. There are people that hear information, they see something that they could be doing better in their lives, and they make a change. They, whether it be something simple, like we talked about the one simple change, whether it be kind of everything, they go, no, I need to change something. And they use their willpower and they change it for the better. The other type of people are the people that wait for something bad to happen, whether that be health-related or something. But in the health field, if something bad happens to you or somebody you love, it really does wake up, kind of wake you up and light a fire under your butt. Now, unfortunately, in health, sometimes waiting too long or waiting for something bad to happen can be too late, whether that be a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. So I always say that there's no such thing in health to start early, but there's such a thing as too late. So who are you going to be? And I would recommend that if you do want to make a change, you start not now, but right now. So yeah, that's my presentation on osteoporosis. Um, when I was doing the reading for this, it was very interesting because I, I learned a lot that I didn't know. And the one that stood out to me is how young we are in those critical periods with um, building our bone structure and having that for the rest of our life and how long it takes for bone to turn over. And that... It is a slow process, but it can be changed with time and with good, good choices with exercise and lifestyle.